Welcome to another episode of What's Going On in Japan Tech Market Podcast.、Uh, today, I have two very special guests my great buddy Lorraine from Toronto and a very good friend Mika as well from Tokyo. These two persons are like very amazing UI UX designers, and this episode is especially focused on how to build a successful career in UI UX in two different regions of the world, in Japan and Canada. So, without further delay, let me just go to Lorraine and Mika. So, Lorraine and Mika, how are you guys doing today? Pretty good, pretty good. I'm super excited to have this. So, thank you for uh, for uh, having us uh,、yeah. in your podcast. It's it's my pleasure, guys.、Uh, would, you, would you like to a little bit, you know, briefly introduce yourself? What do you guys do? Like, where are you guys at? Anything in general? You want to go first? Go. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll、Mika、go you first. Go first. I'm still、okay. having coffee. Hello, everybody. Uh, hello, listeners. Hello, viewers.、Uh, I'm Mika.、Uh, I am born and raised in the Philippines, but now I am based in Tokyo, Japan. And I started off as a software engineer in the Philippines, but over time I became more interested in、uh, the design side. And so I transitioned to a, a UX、uh, design role, and now I am a UX UI lead in Tokyo, Japan. Nice to meet you, everybody. <laughs> nice to meet you too. <laughs> How about you, Lorraine? Oh, so hey, everyone. I am Lorraine.、Um, I also go by Lori, too.、Uh, I am born and raised in Toronto, and I also lived in Tokyo, Japan for a few years, and that's where I met, I met you all there.、Um, but before doing、uh, UX, I was actually doing,、um, I was a career hopper, so I did、uh, recruiting, and then also I did. Uh, travel and tourism. And then I moved into uh, UX uh, just because I wanted to get into tech and be more creative. And then now I'm a UX designer here in Toronto. Wow. Awesome. So I think、uh, Mika said that she's in the UI, UI UX, and Lorraine is in UX. But I'm not really sure like, what is the difference between UI and UX? Like, could you guys a little bit tell me like, what is the difference between that, these two things? Well,、uh, I, if, if you don't mind me going first. <laughs> okay. So, well, first of all, like, what is UI UX, right? So,、um, it stands for user interface, user experience. And UI UX design,、um, basically, it's the discipline、uh, where you try to create the optimum way. Uh, that a user can interact with a product. So, for the most part, it's a digital product, but it's not limited to that. And、um, you make a, an interaction in a way that fulfills the needs and the expectations of your users. And at the same time, it satisfies the business needs of、um, whichever client or company is providing that particular service for a、um, specific、uh, set of users. And to differentiate UX and UI, so UI is、uh, like I mentioned earlier, it means user interface. So it's, this is basically the part that is、uh, that faces the customer. So if it's the app that is、uh, the, for example, the screen where they click on things, and the user experience is basically the whole thing that brings all of these interfaces together. How do they,、uh, how are they connected with each other? So, I would say UI is、um, some sort of subset within UX. So, UX is like the overarching、um, discipline, and then UI is just a part of that. Okay, interesting.、Yeah. So, it's、mm -hmm. more like front and back. So, if we differentiate, if we use the ideation of like software, so we have the front end and the back end. So, UX is more on the back, like having the ideation, the business the needs, and UI is more on the front where people can touch that, you know, the, the interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I would say so. I think, in terms of like the back, it's like in your head, like because UX is more、mm -hmm. like、uh, solving, like UX does more like the solving user problems, like thinking of their pain points and then、yeah. creating like the recommendations and solutions. And there's a lot of research involved in those,、um, in those designs. And then UI is definitely like the first impression, so the, first, the front end. So、um, most of the, I would say, like, yeah, most of the users would definitely see like the UI side、mm -hmm. of it. So I guess, like, yeah, UI gets more of the,、um, The attention, but UX is definitely the brains behind. 
behind it. Does like uh, is like um, anyone can be. I mean, is one person can be both, like UX and UI, or it is like it's specialized and um, you are just specializing in UX. Someone is specializing in UI. How does that work? Um, I think it, I think it depends on the the type of company. Um, so I know some of them now are. I think most of them now are trying to do both. Uh, do both uh, UX and UI because they do overlap. Like I don't see, I don't even like see myself doing just like UX. I also do like UI as well. And I think it's just a way for um, companies just to, I guess, like save money as well. I think in the past they did, um, they split it up, but now it's like, because they both are similar and they both overlap. I think now that more companies are combining the two roles now. So I think it's recommended to know both actually. Could you tell me more like some of your kind of favorite or best kind of, I don't, I don't know whether it's best practice or not, but some of your you know, favorite examples of UX, you would you'd consider something as a you know, good UX, like how is that? Mm. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go a bit offline on this because <laughs> sure. whenever I think about good UX, I always think about the Japanese vending machines. Mm-hmm. Um, because first of all, they're usable and they're delightful and they're always strategically placed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that for example, when you go on a hike here in Japan, so for example, Mount, uh, Takao, when yeah. you go on a hike at Mount mm-hmm. Takao at the, once you reach the summit, there's a vending machine waiting for you mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to get mm-hmm. some drinks mm-hmm. and you can, you have a lot of options and you can pay through cash. You can pay with your um, train pass card. So it's super usable, user friendly, and um, it's something that I always miss whenever I leave Japan. Mm-hmm. And so I would say it's a it has a good UX. And another um, uh, instance that I would say a good UX is the time when I went on a medical checkup here in uh, in Japan. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know the technical lingo, you know, medical technical uh, lingo here in Japan. But um, at never at any point I was lost when I went to the clinic because they set up the um, the signages so so well that when you once you enter the clinic, you're gonna know where to go. And that's I think one of the hallmarks of good UX is is when your user never gets lost wherever mm-hmm. they're at in in the product. And so uh, the examples I gave are just like real life yeah. examples, but these are some principles that can also translate uh, on the digital side. Sure. How about you, Lorraine? Like, what did you consider a good example of a great UI? Of a great UI. Um, uh, I want to pass it off in Japan as well, because I haven't <laughs> seen any in, um, so far yet in Canada. But just like what's amazed me is, um, team lab um they are my my hero um i love like the work that they do so like um mm-hmm. and they have like a museum in tokyo team lab borderless yeah. and then planets but i think planets closed um and i just remember i was like one of the first people that went when it opened and i just remember like um the way that when you go into the museum the way that they set it up um so like if like they mostly focus on um, art and technology so most of their uh work is basically um it's basically lights and then um so they are projected into the wall uh so if you were let's say turn off like all the electricity then you just see like plain walls um and it's just like it's just pretty boring but i love like the the work that they do is that they take something that's like um that's like boring and then they elevate it into something Mm -hmm. that's interesting which is like Mm -hmm. art and technology and um the whole experience was like very interactive Mm-hmm. to like sometimes when you like touch um like yeah. touch walls they there's like lights will pop up and and it's very simple too it's just they're just like using lights to um to create something beautiful so definitely team lab is just like one of my favorite um experiences and that's in japan so <laughs> how about how about any simple app for instance like uh you know the apps which uh general users use it could be calculator it could be instagram because not many people knows uh team lab for sure so i want to know a little bit maybe some of one or two examples you'd consider as a great ui Hmm. 
I'm not sure if this is also well known to to the general public, <laughs> but, but uh, I uh, use this app called Dalio. But it's basically a, a simple logging uh, mood tracker app where you wow. log in uh, your mood for the day, mm -hmm. and it gives it alerts you. Uh, you can set uh, at which point you wanna at uh, what time of day you wanna log in your mood. And then you can just, you know, simply choose, okay, on a scale of one to five, how are you feeling for that day? Okay. And and you log and then you also choose, okay, what what activities were you doing that day? Mm -hmm. And and they and then it just displays the trend of your mood and it it has this beautiful like analytics mm -hmm. <laughs> visuals. And uh, I would say it's pretty straightforward and okay. it it does the job. So what's the name of the app again? It's called Dailyo. Daily O. Dailyo. Yeah. So D A Y L I O. D A Y L I O. Okay. For our viewers, just if you yeah. want to try have a good example of great UI, you can log into Dailyo. So I want to know a little <laughs> bit more about um, like your workflow. Like, I mean, how does your work? I mean, would you kindly walk me through your workflow? Uh, I guess for me, it's. It, it depends. It's very different. It really depends on like where the client or like the client or like the business is at. Um, so there's like no standard um, workflow, but like if there's usually I would always like think of like the problem. So like always like business or clients, they'll always um, have a problem. And so from there, I have to ask all these questions. I'd be like, OK, like um, what's uh, what's like the user's pain points and like what are the what are the business goals? What does the user goals want? And then from there, I kind of have like a plan of action after I figure out what the problem is. Uh, so mostly I would always do um, a little bit of uh, research for due diligence, um, like a competitive analysis, just to see like how the industry is doing this. If there's like a similar problem that our competitors have solved. Um, and then it, and then if there's, um, if I had to change like some uh, like hierarchy of the, of the structure, like the site structure, um, I'll, I'll tech sometimes do like user flows just to map out the new flow. Um, and then even, um, and even also like brainstorm too with my, with my colleagues. Uh, so we'll do like design thinking sessions. Uh, to and then um, once that we come up with like a solution then usually um, we'll try to uh, look at like do wireframes which is like 90 percent of our work is like wireframes which is our solutions and then um, after that um, I'll present it to like the first iteration to business and then depending on the feedback it can go through many iterations um, like it, it really depends maybe two or three maybe even more than that and then once um, it gets approved by business, um, then it can be ready to develop. But yeah, it really depends a case by case basis. It really depends on what the problem is. Um, but that's what I love about UX is like, you're like a detective and you just have yeah. to like try to solve problems and then have like your tools, which is like, yeah, like the research kind of analysis, the flows, the user flows, and then, um, yeah. And then work on a solution. How about you, Mika? Like, how do you define your workflow or how do you do it? Well, for me, well, first I do research and then I I do ideation and then design solutions. But in that order, if I'm living in an ideal world. <laughs> so if I live in an ideal world, that, that was that's what I would do. But um realistically, there's I don't really have a one size fits all workflow because right. it um, it all depends on first of all um, what constraints do I have and for example sometimes you need to come up with something in a few days or you know uh, depends on the task depends on the resources that is available to you so um, even though I don't have like a particular like oh I do this I do that and and then I do that. Um, there are things that I really try my best to get right whenever I, I'm in a project, and that is making sure that uh, I'm making design for the right customer, meaning I should have an idea who is going to be using uh, whatever I come up with and aligning with the business, meaning we should be um, 
in the same page when it comes to the requirements, the goals, the scope of the solution that um, we have to deliver. And other than that, it all depends now on the, for example, the timeline of the project, depending on um, how fast do we need to, to ship um, or release a, a product or a feature, then that's how I um, structure in my head. Okay, mm -hmm. this is what I'm going to be doing. So maybe that means if let's say I already have data, if, for example, there's already like a customer data that's already been um, defined, mm -hmm. then I can go straight to conceptualizing the solution. But then again, um, it all depends because yeah. sometimes we may run into things like, okay, we're not sure if this is the right solution. Then perhaps that it'd be better to have a brainstorming session together. So it, it all depends and it's super important to be adaptable because at the, at the end of the day, you don't really design things in a vacuum and you're not like a one man show, uh, especially when you're working in a corporate environment where there are a lot of stakeholders in a project. So you need to be um, collaborative and adaptable to like changes in terms of, you know, the project timelines and all those things. So, uh, so I think nowadays, like we all are working remotely or we are working from home or, you know, people are working from different time zones comparing to, you know, two, three years ago where we were all working at the same office where design thinking was a pretty, pretty common thing. We'd be doing uh, the morning standups where also, I guess, uh, you know, together with the team members. So um, I think Mika, you mentioned that adaptability is very important in our job, especially in your areas, right? So how did you guys adopt this work from home culture or are you guys still working remotely? Like what's the situation right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still working um, remotely. Um, I think like in here in, um, in Toronto, uh, they are, they're starting to come, they're starting to do a hybrid model mm -hmm. now. Uh, so like one to two days a week, but now I, my company, um, they are really flexible. They're, um, they actually don't really care if you work like in the office, we have an office or you work remotely. And I think, um, to be honest, I, I actually enjoy it because um, commuting in Toronto is such a pain. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, delays. So um, I think it just saves like at least like an hour of my time. And okay. um, I also save a lot of money to like buying food. So and honestly, like I think like it's going to be like this, um, like trending forward. And even a lot of them, um, there's a lot of American companies coming into um, Toronto too, hiring for um, talent there. So I think it just opens up even better wow. job opportunities. Yeah, That's so great. I think- That's great. Yeah. I think remote work is like the future. The future. How about you, Mika? Like how things are in, in Tokyo? Well, ever since the pandemic started, I've been working from home. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think uh, even though Japan is quite known to be uh, traditional, especially in terms of um, ways of working, but I see that shifting now, um, especially uh, even, though, even before the pandemic, um, started there's already like a, a trend that's pointing to a more remote um, way of working mm -hmm. but that but the pandemic just accelerated all of that and right. now um, there are companies here in Japan that um, offer full remote um, full remote uh, setup so you, you can choose to uh, apply for those kind of companies if let's say that is more of your style um, but at the same time, there are also companies who are veering towards a more hybrid way of working, uh, kind of what uh, my company is um, at right now. So even though we're still primarily working remotely, but uh, we're going to that direction of a more hybrid model going forward right. now that um, I think um, hopefully uh, the restrictions are going to get um, are going to go Withdrawn. soon. Hopefully, yeah, yeah, yeah. John, yeah. Sure. So, so I mean, uh, for the engineers, right? I think it's a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Like, I, it's just my opinion. Like, it could be a little easier, but for designers like yourself, like, you need a lot of creativity, design thinking, perhaps sitting together, a lot of debates, a lot of arguments, right? So, I, I wonder, mm. like, how is that? That I mean, it, is there any constraints when you do that remotely? Like, or it's just fine? Like, the technology has solved those things already technology yeah. i think has solved it right yeah i think so um like 
there's so many technology tools like Miro and Mural and even mm. like Figma, Fig Jam. Um, like, yeah, like they're very, they're amazing for holding design thinking sessions uh, remotely. Like I've never done one in person and mm. I don't even know how I would do one in person because wow. it's just so easier now. That, that's a great tools. info, I think, for, for non-designers or people from non-technical background, because we always had an image that how, how they do it. But I think what you mentioned, those tools might be game changer. Mm-hmm. Definitely, for sure. Yeah. I mean, of course, there's still something magical when you're doing it in person because, you know, you really get to gauge with everyone and it's a different dynamic versus online. But I think it's not necessarily um, like a mandatory thing that, oh, we, we should be doing things offline unless it's uh, a project that involves uh you know uh you having to go to the customers things like that but um for the most part you can all you can do almost anything online at this point i see Mm -hmm. and so moving to the next part of my question is uh, how do you respond to the negative feedbacks online because maybe when this was uh in person like hey your colleague was just saying i don't like this or maybe that's not the way but now uh is there a lot of back and forth uh, teams or zoom conversation or, or how's the you know the accepting the feedback online virtually or you know just is this in general for you guys how do you guys react to the feedbacks um, i always take the feedback as like um trying to differentiate which is subjective and which is objective like if the feedback is something like i just don't like it um I kind of have to dwell and understand like the reason why they don't like my solution. So, cause it, that's a very subjective term. So usually I'm always asking like questions because if they don't like it, um, maybe I need to understand their thought process of why they don't like it. So I'm always like asking them questions like, um, what don't you like about it? Like, can you be more specific and tell me like, is there something that I missed? Um, for example, because we all have a different way of thinking. So I think just like, take don't not taking it like personally um, and just like um, filtering out which one can be actionable, which feedback is can be actionable, which one is subjective and objective because sometimes um, the feedback that I get, maybe they don't understand like the technical constraints when I was told about the technical constraints, for example. So I think it's like just important to just like, um, just keep on asking questions and then try to um, reach a consensus of like what feedback can be actionable because sometimes like you can't take all the feedback. Um, it's just not possible. So you have to like work with like teamwork and try to like compromise with the team and see, okay, like this can be done. Um, but this one, maybe we have to do it like next year, for example, because the designs are always evolving. They're never stagnant. So like maybe next year we can open up this discussion again. Anything you want to add, Mika? No. nothing to add actually because i i also do the same thing uh whenever i get feedback and i don't understand the context behind it i always ask why and for the most part it's uh it's because maybe they know something that i don't and especially for example with uh teams like marketing where they really are involved with the customer a lot so they usually have uh, a lot of like um, insights on what customers may want and so whenever they have feedback on my work I really make sure that um, I know the rationale behind it. Got it and how do you guys find your inspiration like uh, I think there's a lot of uh, motivation inspiration required to kind of match the client's requirement or or just in general right because you guys are creative people comparing to maybe any other occupations so what's your you know secret sauce inspiration is <laughs> like um inspiration like as in um like to do like our solutions or just like everyday life like oh uh, could be it could be both i mean uh mm-hmm. because everyday life is comprised with your designing <laughs> career right so yeah okay um honestly i always look because um i do draw a lot of inspiration from japan um because i think here in, um like in canada they're very fascinated by japanese culture and I think um, I'm at that bridge where I actually understand Japanese culture and then I can bring that back into Canada. So like, I'm always looking to see like, how is Japan doing it? Cause Japan's pretty, um, I, what I love is that they're very innovative. They're never um, they're because they are stuck on their, um, on like their own Island. They're able to create all these like amazing um, 
amazing designs. So I always look at that, um, seeing what Japan is doing, looking at some of their apps to see like their apps or their websites to see like, how can I bring this back into Canada? And I do see some differences too. And I like that Japan is like more detailed in like um, thinking about more the user because in Canada, I think um, uh, in the culture itself, it's a bit um, like individualistic. So I like bringing back like the collectivism that Japan has into Canada and just being more like attentive and thinking about like um, like having that empathy, and I think Japan is, does a very great job in that empathy set. So yeah, I'm sorry if you wanted something more, but like because you you both are in Japan and you're like, okay, what are you guys talking about? Like we're living in Japan, no but I, I did not see any of the stuff until I like left. How about you, Mika? Like, do you have anything which inspires you, like, or you know, especially in designing, like? Yeah, well, for me, um, okay, the thing is, whenever I design something, so for example, I'm designing a fintech app, mm -hmm. hypothetically, Yeah. But, but I would try to draw inspiration from things that aren't really related to fintech. So maybe I'll design a fintech app, but I will draw inspiration from e-commerce, let's say. Mm -hmm. So I try to like bring in something new from uh, a, maybe something that is totally unrelated to what I'm making. And sometimes even things offline that I see are that I think are quite phenomenal. For example, the the way vending machines work in Tokyo, maybe some of the way it works, I can incorporate it. So it's sort of like an analogous way of um, taking inspiration mm -hmm. and then fusing it with what I'm doing. Like for example, like just just in general things, like you take basically inspiration from daily life, like walking mm. around from the train, from the vending machines, those kind of things. Okay, that makes really good it sense. It can come from anywhere, right? Okay. Inspiration mm -hmm. can come from anywhere. Certainly. Mm -hmm. So so mm -hmm. this is my last question as we're running out of a bit of time. So uh, I think in Japan, Mika, you know that language is a big barrier, right? So people who wants to get into UI, UX, uh, Japanese language is essential for foreigners. Whereas in Canada, there might be no language barriers like because it's in English, right? Mostly. Or maybe there might be French requirement or any other requirement, which I don't know. But uh, what would be your suggestion, like one or two tips maybe from a Canadian's perspective and a Japanese perspective for the future UI UX, you know, designers? Um, I think, yeah, if you are looking to um, aspire to be a UX UI designer and you want to break in here into, um, into Canada, um, I, it is quite, it is quite tough. I am not going to lie, um, but it can be done. Um, I felt that having like a mentor, so talking to someone that's already in the industry um, was still, was very helpful um, because UX UI industry is still very new and not understood. So talking to someone in the industry can actually help you get a, gain insights um, when looking for a job. So you'll know like what the, the types of like hot jobs are out there or even like getting that portfolio overview because the portfolio is actually the most important piece when getting a job because that's the, that's the only piece that where they can see your, your design thinking. So I think having a mentor really helps you and then they'll help um, refine, refine um, and give you tips on like how to um like polish your portfolio so i think like adp list is like one of the great ones because it's free and amika is a mentor on there so you guys yeah. gotta talk to her <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah yeah and then um i guess yeah you can check out our podcast too me and mika we have a podcast um okay, called designer yeah. sushi yeah so Sorry, what is the name we, of your podcast uh it's designer sushi oh my god okay it's it draws upon uh, me and Mika's connection to Japan, but we just like talk about like our, our um, career um, in UX because we were both career transitioners. So that's our perspective is that we're just like having honest discussions and just talking about like um, just our new career and like, how are we navigating mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right. So I think one suggestion we got is designer sushi and the other one you mentioned is having a mentor but i think it's yeah. really tough right to find someone like that to talk to and because everyone is busy right everyone is fighting struggling so uh, how, how do you find your mentor mika or how you, have you found your mentor in japan especially and you know moving from software design software developer to a designer yeah for for my case well i didn't exactly try finding a mentor but i found a community uh, mm -hmm. of designers, of creative people. And I'm part of this uh, meetup group called Creative Tokyo. Okay. And it's a super cool um, group of designers and 
developers, basically tech and creative professionals here in mm-hmm. Tokyo. And it's been such a huge help uh, forming connections, um, establishing a network, and um, basically meeting like-minded people. And I think if you're starting out as a designer, especially here in Tokyo, um, it it really pays to uh, be connected to a network of um of professionals who can uh, help you uh, in your career. And um, like Lori mentioned, uh, the portfolio is the bread and butter of yeah. every designer. And mm-hmm. so I would really uh, suggest that um, don't really focus on how you learn UX because there are a lot of um, resources online and uh, you don't really have to pay so much money to learn about UX and UI. Uh, but really focus on applying what you learned right away. And that is through a portfolio because that is what uh, the recruiters are going to be looking for. That's what companies um, really examine whenever they mm-hmm. they look through um, different applications. And that's what's going to get you the job. Great. And how long would that take to create a portfolio for a fresh designer who just started learning or taking courses? Like mm-hmm. how long would that take to from that starting point to be able mm. to publish a portfolio and get into the job market? I think it took, depends, right? Yeah. It depends. Mine yeah. took a long time. I think after I finished my boot camp, I think mine took about when I was ready to submit it to job applications, I think mine took about six or seven months um, because I wanted to gain like case studies that were impactful. And then I felt that the case studies that I had when I finished my boot camp didn't um weren't like i didn't want to present that yet so i had to like look for another case study so how long was your boot camp uh it was about three months so three months another six months of uh coming up with your portfolio yeah yeah but it's okay. case by case it's case perhaps by case. Uh, i don't know about mika like how long was that for you hmm i think around the same time as lori because okay. I, I, the way i w- went about with my portfolio is i was creating it alongside my day job at the time Mm -hmm. which was in software engineering so I was kind of like doing it um like for example after work I would work on it Mm -hmm. for like an hour each day and that took a while Mm -hmm. but eventually it paid off and that landed me my first job great so guys we're running out of time we'll wrap up this conversation here and we'll have another follow-up episode about this same topic and i really appreciate your time guys and thank you so much and i hope we can you know catch up again soon and you know keep talking about this uh, building a career in ui ux awesome thank you for having us thank you